Okay, hi everyone. Good evening. Welcome, welcome to um, Unraveling the Thread. Um, I've been working with the Writing Squad and Barbican Young Poets um, to trace the lost stories and roots of her English heritage. Everyone selected English heritage sites and did research. And we're inviting you to follow the threads with us this evening um, as we unpack ancient languages, raid castles, dismantle and rebuild legends, sip on flying ointment, and excavate the coffins of forgotten history. Our readings will undulate, twist, and flow seamlessly into each other, mapping Cornwall, Cumbria, Lancaster, and beyond. Um, and this is a conversation. The, we'll be unraveling the threads moving seamlessly from one poet to the other. Um, and then we'll be unraveling the threads with you at the end. So please listen out for any inspiration, any inspirational lines, any questions that you have, because at the end we'll have a conversation with you. Um, and first of all, I'm gonna welcome and open the floor with Helen. Um, and the Arthurian link to this site is that Arthur was supposedly conceived at Tintagel. But as I discovered through my research, he was conceived in a rape by deception. Did you know that? Because I only found that out when researching for this poem. Um, I guess I was wondering what does that mean for the stories that we tell and for the details that we don't focus on. Um, when I started writing this, I thought I'd write about race, but I ended up exploring sexuality instead. Um, I recently realized that I'm bi, so I've been thinking about how, how gay and bi women have been ignored and erased from history. Um, so the speaker of my poem is Guinevere, and Arthur probably didn't exist. Historians don't think he really exists, so who's to say that Guinevere didn't like men and women? Um, this poem is uh, indebted to Cecilia Knapp and the po Roundhouse Poetry Collective, um, in whose workshop I started writing this poem, um, and Julia Anastasia Pelosi Thorpe. Um, so in my other role as co-director of Devilman Poet Society, um, I've just co-guest edited the upcoming issue of Modern Poetry and Translation with a focus on Devilman poets. Um, and Julia submitted these amazing, irreverent, modernized translation of this Roman poet called Sulpicia, who's like complaining about her boyfriend not wanting to spend her birthday with her and stuff. Um, the launch for that is tomorrow. So you should come to that if you enjoy what I'm about to hear. But that was kind of an inspiration in terms of tone. Um, finally, just a quick note that my <laughs> poem is seven minutes long. It's the longest one you'll hear tonight, so um, don't be sitting there being like, oh my god, it's going to be such a long evening. Um, it's just it's just me, guys. <laughs> so I uh, cannot share my screen at this very moment, but um, Caroline, if you're able to allow me to do that, then I... Aha! Fab. Right, here we go. So the poem is called Witch Not. And we start here. Witch knot. Merlin tied my hair in a witch knot and it really messed with my day. Everyone in the castle was like, hey, nice hair, looking good today. And I was like, I literally cannot untie this, please help me. I guess it's a good form of torture, like the endless dancing curse or the one where you infect everything with gold, the hair that doesn't represent your true self. But Nobody believed me. Everybody thought I just had nice hair. When I woke up, the bedroom was covered in reticello. Glass threads everywhere. What a nightmare. Had to get Gwen's boy in to chisel through so I could break fast. Must be an assassin failing again. Weird one though, Arthur didn't seem too bothered. We went hunting as planned. I landed a deer, beautiful thing. So sad you can't eat the skin. Moilsome work, says Rose, my second most depressing maid. I get her to repeat herself, ask where she learned moilsome. Feels like a slug to something that can't feel it, moilsome. I seek out Arthur, Morgan, Arthur's half-sister, say, teach me. In the grove, she sits right by me, shows me papyrus and feather, how to bring language from quick little movements again, again, to conjure sound, says it is no magic or not the kind Merlin taught. She sits right by me, Morgan, the half-sister. Merlin walks down the spiral staircase and says, how's it hanging? He is wearing his evil look so well today. Where's Arthur, I ask. Dunno, he says, have you checked with the horses? There's a nice new stable hand. I want to scratch Merlin with 10 fingernails to see if he'd screech. 
but that's not polite. He bites into an apple and vanishes, leaving six eggs in his place, rolling gently in all directions. Weird joke. Gareth tries to grab them before they smash into something, and I go to the stables, just in case. Arthur's not been himself lately, and even when you shake salt rings outside the door, Merlin has a way of getting in. But the stables are vacant as an empty hood. I take a torch from the wall and my knuckles are pink like screaming, pink like Merlin's cheeks. One night I ask Arthur if he ever thinks about how he came to be, which is to say how his dad decided Igraine, Morgan's mother, was a door he had to open, a castle he had to take, and not quite in the spirit of fair play, which is to say she wouldn't have if she'd known it was Uther, not her husband. Arthur says, what do you mean? And I say, well, you were made to be blunt, not from love or even desire, but trickery, a deception conception, if you will, a lie just to lay. He says, well, that's how it goes sometimes. The king always gets the girl. I don't open my mouth again till morning, and I don't dream. Sometimes when everyone is asleep, Morgan tells me about Isolt, how she was shipped off with a potion meant to make the wedding night possible, about Tristan in the middle, how his name spelled sadness, but he couldn't read, how the bad dreams came to each of them, Mark not getting the punchline till the end. Our love was a lily on a jealous lake, and the lance was a word nobody could take back. No way to put it out, she says, but sleep. Morgan's clothes are perfect. Everyone else thinks they're weird or a lot, but leopard print really does it for me. And that talk that shines like Merlin's knees, that brooch, the two birds killing each other on Morgan's breast, yes, please. Or, well, you know, I want them for myself. I mean, okay, I've thought about relieving her of that thick coat from behind, her hair falling loose over her shoulder. Merlin says binate means doubled or coupled as he ties up my doppelganger. Someone trying to impersonate you, my lady, he says. Close shave, that. And I think, but don't say, you're the one who cast the spell, gave Uther the skin of Morgan's father, so he looked just like him, sounded so like him. Strange, his sudden passion. Did Igraine ever find out? Presumably, the real husband died that night, doing something noble. One of Arthur's boys got kicked in the stables this morning and everyone stood round wailing like crows. Morgan pushed through, whispered something, made him drink from her pouch, kissed him on the lips and the stark white boy turned pink. Later, Morgan tells me, sometimes it doesn't work, but once life is in a thing, it doesn't want to leave. There is more life in her, brimming like hot soup. And in this whole citadel, I think, this whole land. I need to get out of this castle. I am asking for help. Morgan, take me into the unknown lands. I want to learn how to speak without feeling like a lion merlined out to sea. Morgan, something bad is coming. Can you feel it too? The badness mounting like a rubbish heap waiting to be burnt. Morgan, Merlin took a pitchfork to a girl last week, said she had it coming. The decisions are getting scarier. Let me be a wilder woman. Let me walk out wearing nothing but my hair and sleep on grass. I want to sleep, Morgan. I want these dreams. Thanks, that's me done. Uh, thanks everyone. For listening, um, I'm now going to pass the mic to Prana Kumar, a fellow fellow writing squad member who is studying English at Durham, and I also did English there, and wish we had been in the same cohort because I feel like she's making some serious poetry waves 
from Durham. Um, so we've mapped out the order of this evening so that the subjects flow together. And I feel like Prana's speaker could be a great granddaughter of my Guinevere. So I'm excited to hand over to the brilliant Prana Kumar. Hi guys, my name's Prana. I'm also a very proud Writing Squad graduate. Thanks for that poem, Helen. It was so great. I'm a big fan of Guinevere and it was so amazing to hear her voice come through finally. Um, so the site that I explored was the Stort Park Bobbin Mill in Lake District. And if, if people want to know what a bobbin is, it's the kind of little wooden thing that thread goes around. And it was a big part of the textile industry back in the day. And so while I was doing my research, I found out that a lot of these bobbins were made to exploitative child labor, specifically boys of all ages were forced to work in this mill to produce these. Um, but then I dug a little bit further and I also found out that the, in their history of employment, there was one girl who worked the machines and I just thought I wanted to bring her voice into the poem as well. So yes, I hope you enjoy. I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully everything works. So it's called Highburn for the Bobbin Boys. The mill was a male preserve, although one female worker is recorded in the 1890s. Emily Kerwin, age 13, listed as a bobbin borer, was the daughter of a bobbin turner who lived at Plum Green, census of 1891. The bobbin boys crowding Emily thirst around the water wheel each turn drilling their older ash willowed spines. Each boy wishes their body bobbin shape, raw wood urged long and straight, then little fingers framing them precious to spun hours. Their bodies spooling value long after the rays set, their lungs kissing the lake waters without asking. My body so close to my boys, we ricochet. Metal mice cackling our lungs sharp. Each second spit comes coal shaving the air. Swallowed by his or his mouth. We forget the sound of lake wind. The tongue of a hymn. Our own unlined voices. Behind the belt, Charles asks how a kiss body screams. In answer, I drum his crescent stomach, crater music box, and somewhere in London or Matadi or Melbourne or the small bobbin world of some woman's slender hands, her fingers begin to treble. We do not tell them our joy still comes from laughing. A small warm kitchen, the lake water humming in a pot, each bubble a surging echo of ringing lake ripples. She does not think of her son's fingers grinding to the bone, his lungs basting in the sawdust that churns the air. This wood bodied son among other sons being blaze, growing less into his bark each hour slendering for the mill owner's hand, the threads of him sliding into the lake, how easily a body billows over the wet. She only thinks of gently peeling the carrots for soup, ridding the root of its outer dust, her son happy and soaked and full of the right skin, her eyes Cloudy from years of hopeful soup making, the steam milking her irises without mercy. Through a corner, still untouched, she remembers to feed the absences. Sun shaped, difficult to drown. That was me. Um, hope you enjoyed that. And I'm going to hand it over to the lovely teacher 
who is also writing on the same set. Hi, um, it's, um, it's such an honor to um, be part of this and to come after that poem as well. Um, yeah, I, I love Piranha's writing and um, we both chose to talk about the Stop Park Bobbin Mill. And yes, it's interesting. I think, I think when I was researching for this, I was struck by the way that different types of sites of making um, have, a, have a different relationship to nature. And I was thinking a lot about wood and those daily items in trade like bobbins. Um, and I was also thinking about the rags trade amongst migrant populations in London, particularly amongst like Turkish Cypriots new to London in the late sixties. And, um, you know, both as machinists and as factory foremen. Um, I'm gonna try and screen share for you. Not, not very, yeah, ironically, I'm quite, quite poor with machines. Um, let me have a little crack at this. Ooh. How are we doing? Um, just make it a bit bigger for you. What I could lose in threads. Pit my head against the whir. If you put my hands back 100, 200, they'd be the same but jammed, but crusted, but through a hole and winded. Wood blocked raw, bobbing up like wheat in a belly. I'm a raw block of wood, bloated wet by England. Oh, hands of a fool, not cold, but brittle. Oh, be kind to this fool, fretting in the seal. Singers on my ears to remember my grandmother spinning and weaving. We lose ourselves in threads. I took you from a tree and heard you figging. There were rows and rows of people sitting next to each other, like school. People in front and by your side. 7.30 start, four o'clock break, non-stop. Check your stitches for the pastor, before the ironing ladies, before the Hoffman. Bobbin, get the colors right, back up bobbins, three or four. Where did we all go, Bear? Tell the age of a thing, cycled trunk. Journey from tree to bobbin, belt driven machine, snapping back at me, snapping back at me, snapping back at me. London life to me is so easy. All right, it's hard because I was a worker, but after a while, you sell your clothes to laundry, tax, First two years I was working with Mehmet, one factory in London, one in Birmingham. I was doing 10,000 pieces a week. Oh, they made me tall, not wound, but lapped. Oh, I'm more than a tall turning in the sap. If you put my hands forward 100, 200, they'd be the same, but glitched, but lean but under an arch and blended. Thank you. Um, I also, um, I'm, so I'm to be followed by Phoebe Wagner and she's not here today, but um, yeah, they, um, I think something that um, echoed uh, the two of our poems is that we both have these like voices like ducking in and out of each other and um, and a bit of play on, on women's voices and men's voices. And so, so yeah, then um, they sent in a, a video of their performance, which you'll be able to see now.
Caroline. I don't think the sound is playing on Phoebe's um, performance video. I don't know if everybody else can. Thank you. Yes, I've got that note. I'm just. Um... Okay, try again. Hello everyone, I'm Phoebe Wagner. Um, I cannot be with you tonight, unfortunately, because I am in a bar um, in a theatre. So I am with you in spirit and I'm very, very um, sad that I can't be here tonight. But um, I have really, really enjoyed being a part of this programme. I've loved untangling the threads. We really have done that in this process, um, especially... Uh, just thinking about how we remember things, um, who has a say on um, what that memory looks like and who it looks like and who it includes. Um, and I've come to this programme um, thinking history was quite boring uh, because I grew up, you know, in spaces where I felt like I couldn't really ask questions, uh, where I, as a woman, um, couldn't really ask or interrogate like what about this or have you thought like what where, where were where were these people where were people like me or what you know what happened to them so uh it it means a lot to do this um I'll get on with my poem and yeah so it's called rough music um and it's in response to good Shaw Ta good good Shaw chapel um in Lancashire um yeah, I'm going to screen share with you so that you can read along with me. Um, okay. Rough music with the hymn, The Spacious Firmament. A girl mouths along to the spacious firmament on high in a chapel that smells like dying oak, the light grave blue on pink and brown pews. She sat below the clock with its whistling hands. Her mum paid for this pew box. The villager herded pigs bulging in their styes. The radiators are rattling and pointless. With all the blue ethereal sky, preacher Abraham Nichols is waving the same figures at the front of the congregation. Hollow crab shell back, droning tones, notes, cracking his ribs. Under the bench, she begins to shuffle her growing feet and spangled heavens, a shining frame of women's voices flooding the men's face. Now her little brother's tattered leathered feet, leathered feet launch at the wooden slats, their great worn and original proclaim. The car continues to spin in its, spin its hands, the clock. The clock continues to spin its hands into the unwearied sun from day to day, bringing townspeople in and out of the chapel, pounding offbeats into the wood. No matter how loudly Preacher Nichols continues to sing, does his creator power display. Her mother side-eyes her, holds in a grin. Michael's children to the left to join with their cry to be fed. And this publishes to every land pews in a widening town, the work of an almighty hand. Her eyes lock with nickels. She walks right up to the metal wire behind his eyeballs, cuts it with her pliers. The congregation begin to rumble, a hive of angry bees, nickel's voice now leaning into the storm, the townspeople lustily breathing. Soon as the evening shades prevail, brother, mum, Gina at it devouring the hymn. The moon takes up the wondrous tale of many leathered feet, tides of stock from their broth, crusting at the edges of their lips, turning wet. And nightly to the listening earth, the people paint his shell of a face with spitty broth. She repeats the story of her birth. The girl is the eye of a new storm. The Bennets, their pots and pans, their stolen banjos passed out to the back pews. Are you done digging your grave yet? The congregation sing at the preacher. 
She pushes her way out the box, runs to the blocked opening, banging her ticking fists against the hollow wall. We want to know what's behind here, whilst all the stars that round her burn and all the planets in their turn begin to dress themselves in rotten eggs, the stench pulling the screws from the hinges of the pews. Confirm, townspeople will begin to devour the tidings as they roll, and some spread the truth, like the last of the butter will probe from pole to bowl. What though in solemn pots and pans silence all? God doesn't move round the dark terrestrial ball, covering our ears. Abraham blocks his townspeople. What though nor real voice nor sound, spitting out the doors, two symmetrical eyes leaking into the hill's pores, amid their radiant orbs be found, in reason's ear they all rejoice, their wooden spoon raised, and utter forth. A glorious voice, a noise, a rough music, turning Abraham's breath to wet on windows, forever singing as they shine, their ruckus melting with the chimes, the many mouths that made us is divine. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've, I've had such a wonderful time um reading that um and i hope uh, that you got something from it and i'm really really excited to watch this afterwards <laughs> and see how everyone does um i'm gonna stop screen sharing um thank you thank you so much um it means a lot um have a good night have good luck everyone reading and take care Um, yeah, uh, that was, that was Phoebe. Um, it's such a shame she can, she can be here today to read the poem herself. Um, uh, I'm, I'm next. My name's Fahad. Hello, uh, graduate of the writing squad. Um, and, uh, just like Phoebe, I picked the, uh, Old Baptist Chapel, the Good Shore Chapel to write about. And it was really great being, being paired up with Phoebe because we talked a lot about the musicality of the church. It was really beautiful in her piece, how she interwove music within the, within the poem. Um, and uh, yeah, we both sort of went away and explored that. Uh, and what struck me about the chapel was not just the building itself or the history of nonconformism in, in the Northwest and in, in England in general, but was, was the chapel in the context of Lancashire and the Northwest and being surrounded by the mills and, and all that, those associations. So what I wanted to do in, in, in my piece was really unravel that, take a snapshot of the chapel in its surrounding area and, and see what happened when you looked at it, unraveling its history. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen now. An overexposed image of the old Baptist chapel. There were days you couldn't see valley for smog but you could hear the singing all the way from Cribden Hill. The low hum of a double bass making the dales undulate in tetrameter and flagstone. Like vocal cords in the neck of a country that swallows oceans and calls them bottles. Floating prayers that raise cities to a scattering of headstones, all in the name of smoke. See the heads rising out the mills in bitter harmony. Songs that scored the south wall, uneven as scales tipping the collection box. They had keyholes for pulpits. Congregations huddled round a door to be auctioned off. This was music unraveling the flesh. Music grinding wood into pulp for the Bibles and singing pews, drowning the valleys in deafening hymn. In Christianity and commerce, this is God's own country. What he gives can only be returned. An oak tree grows around the old chapel, pulling the grit stone back in symmetry to where the old road used to meet the new by the White Horse Inn. There you can see the larks of Dean peddling believers from a rival church. We've always seemed to have good singers. Men and women spun together in the finest cotton, like air bubbles pushing against the spine of slaves, raising their voices to the sun. Only the elect can hold a note, 
and throw it away. But if you look closely enough, you will see the shadows that guard faith and be able to pass your hand right through the windows on the first floor that were once on the ground. And once before that, slates carried on the backs of people gathered in Lum Marketplace watching William Mitchell standing on an upturned stool, God's own rock, fighting the bailiffs as they, God's own children, tried to drag his body down. Now I'm gonna stop sharing. Which I don't know how to do. Okay, cool, done. Um, and now I'm going to pass over to Amani. Is that correct? That is totally right. Uh, who's also decided to speak on Good Choice Chapel. Hi, everyone. Nice to virtually see you all. And thank you, Fahad, for that take on Good Shore Chapel. I'm also going to share my screen. And I wanted to show you all. Oh, no. Come on, you can do this uh, while I talk to you and try and figure out how to do this because Zoom has decided oh, it will not be able to record the contents of your screen until it's quit. No, leave me alone. Um, I think I can share this. Let's say I can share this. Um, I wanted to show you all what Good Shot Chapel looked like, which is like this. I hope you can all see it. And it looks very plain. And I think that's what drew me to it. The fact that this is a house of worship where you're supposed to talk about all of God's glory. And it is the plainest little box of a house, so gray, so you know, unassuming. But I think that's exciting because it leaves a lot of room for devotion within that. And I found a lot of similarities in, I think, Islam, um, because I'm a Muslim, in terms of sort of that aspect of it, of just sort of, you know this unadorned house that you are meant to help build by hand. A community is meant to build together as the Baptist did to build Good Shore Chapel um, and celebrate the glory of God within that. So I'm going to share my poem with you now, if it will let me. Yes, it will. Oh, come on. You can do this. You can do this, computer. You can do this. Give me one second, guys. I'm sorry about this. Tech is so clunky, so we just keep talking and filling the space until we can share. Come on, come on. No, you won't do it. I can't share it, guys, I'm sorry, but I'll just read it out for you and hopefully put it in the chat later. I would dig up Halifax to build you a home. I would carry every single stone, jagged and fresh plucked from the maw of the earth, down the hills to town, just to pass my ragged hands over its face and find yours in it would chisel until your features emerged, sudden and smiling, would stumble through veils of green for you, arms out, eyes closed, hands expectant. No, you would guide me, plain as I am, as gray, as small, as a good mother would. I promise to raise you the plainest house, the smoothest, blandest pews, the barest roof, slot the seats to converge around you like a coliseum beloved. Converge on your glory. I'll extinguish hell with a bucket. Set the heavens ablaze like Rabia. Run like she ran wild through the desert, as do the winds of the moor too, toozling the heather heads with divine abandon. Oh, I pine for you. I burn. I burn so that your voice rips through me, that when I tip my head back and unfurl my mouth, the sound comes bounding out, bouncing and unbidden and joyful beloved so joyful that's me i am now going to pass you on to gregory who has also written about good shot chapel and who has probably written one of the most banging first lines i've ever had the privilege of hearing in my life so i'll hand over to gregory now that's very kind of you to say amani and what a poem um can you hear me excellent i can see my own face so I'm assuming that means you can hear me and what a beautiful face it is. Um, so I'm going to explain a lot about my poems, about this poem, because I feel like I spent lots of time agonizing about specific details. And if you don't pick up on it, I'll be very upset. So I'll tell you and then I'm off the hook. Um, so when looking at, uh, I did Good Shore Chapel as well. And there was loads of things that were quite interesting about it for me. Um, 
one of the main things that really interested me was it was originally um, one chapel on the other side of a moor, which a community like took apart and then they went across the moor to join another uh, community and rebuild it into the one that uh, is there today. Um, and I find something that is integral to history is this kind of idea of dis disintegration and recombining um, that what is present right now, all the particles and all the stuff is going to be present where in like hundreds of years of time, thousands of years, all the particles are going to be there, but in a different format. And that's something really interesting. And because I'm a pessimistic person, I guess, um, that is very strongly linked to death for me. Um, and so the idea of us dying and recombining is something really interesting, uh, especially thinking about our historical traditions. Um, when writing poems um, to a deadline, it can be really stressful trying to find like arbitrary rules to mean you write it. So um, I looked at a couple of poems, one that was published the year the first chapel was built, which is called Night Thoughts by Edward Young, um, which were really interesting. He was a vicar, I believe, who um, wrote um, this poem called Night Thoughts about grief, and they were all in iambic pentameter. So I stole that and I was like, right, I'm going to do 10 syllable lines. So that's in there. You've got to notice that because I spent ages making every sure, I'm sure every line was 10 syllables. I also was looking at The Clod and the Pebble by William Blake, where William Blake, being the sort of crazy guy that he is, just makes inanimate objects speak. Um, and then also the word chapel comes from St. Martin's Cloak, which is a religious story where it was cut in half and then half of it was kept in a place and people looked after it. And the place it was looked after, it was called a chapel from probably the Latin, um, um, which uh, then became um, chapel uh, from um, cloak uh, and then chaplain, because they're the people who looked after it. Anyway, I will show, oh, the other thing, that I've got to pat myself on the back for both sections there's like a part one and part two both sections are 18 lines long which is the time between the first chapel being bought and the second chapel being bought uh built not bought um you can tell that I was just trying to find ways of trying to get this poem written anyway I'll share my screen now and I will read it for you hopefully um All right. All right, yeah. Okay, so this is called Chapel. And like the dead, I wake to find myself lying in the grass, soil, then sandstone, time folds and becomes toric, mistaking millions of years for a few short seconds. Scooped from the earth, I am formed into brick gathered with other bricks to make a wall, and with other walls we make a chapel, a chapel that is half cloak and half clock. Often the dead are hidden and timely, and presently they are all that holds us in place. The tools scrape, then ring like a bell across the moor. The day digs and buries the sun into the earthy horizon. Tonight, I am back to my old restless habits. I'm still awake when one day folds into another. Who decided that we must sleep when it is dark? History is just remembering life before this one body. One of my lifetimes was spent as a boy, always wondering what might be unseen about buildings. All the hands turn to raise them from the ground. He visits a chapel where all the dead contained within the walls howl, cohering into song. Try and name every single soul that stepped into this room. 
Here he could point to the speck in the brick that makes his name a hymn, colours his mind. He sees a village break down one chapel to bits and carry it across the moor. The pews held on their shoulders like coffins and from the rubble the chapel is reshaped. To be human means to be buried, cloaked by the earth, fully baptised in the mud our hands reaching for the materials for us to build ourselves across the moor. And like the dead, I wake to find myself. All right. Thank you very much for listening to my poem. Um, next up, um, as you were told earlier, our poems are sort of interlinking in terms of theme and style and all sorts of wonderful things. So uh, next up, looking at Tintagel Castle, um, with rather similar Blakeian chaos, maybe, um, is Simran. Well, I'm not sure anyone has ever used the word Blakeian chaos to describe anything I've ever done before. And I absolutely love it. I would like to have someone following me around, introducing me as being like, hello, welcome to Blakeian chaos into the, into the room. Um, so as, as Gregory said, um, after that incredible piece, uh, this piece is about Tintagel Castle, that um, wonderful old castle down in Cornwall, linked to these myths of King Arthur in one way or another. Um, and a lot of this piece stems from the conversations that we had in this amazing space I feel so happy to have been a part of, especially some wonderful conversations I had with Lydia, who's um, coming up next. Um, and it's a lot about perhaps the way people use the land um, inside and around institutions, um, the things they do, whether it's kind of kids mucking around or um, kind of alternative, non-institutional spiritual communities. Um, how do people do that on the land? Um, what do they use from the land to support them in that? Let me share my screen. Wonderful. Oh, this piece is called Flying Ointment. <clears throat> we clamber around the rocks behind the castle. Theo leads us through the cliff. Harriet trips over the English heritage fence. The farmer next door doesn't mind. The sea in front of you, green, moving safe. There are traces in the archaeology for 3,000 years, Theo says. Psychedelics were always consumed here. Witches made ointments for tiny doses of plants. We did the same in the 80s, wandering festival, herbal first aiders, new queer witches picking plants from the hedgerows as we walked, olive oil jars in the back of the tent full of mugwort, fly agaric, lion's head, salvia. They had olive oil here, I say, my friend Lydia told me. Shipped from Algeria, Lebanon, but only for the rich man. The chef who dressed King Arthur's salad didn't eat it. Where do they live now? How do they spend their evenings? Who, who sailed the ship round the sea? Who carried the oil up the steps? What did you do in the evening after clambering over the steps? Anyway, Theo is still talking about the witch practice. No institution, she said, lived religion, folk religion. Before the church, everyone took psychedelics here. White tourists haggle over ayahuasca now, but this land has mugwort, fly agaric, lion's head, salvia. They gathered, we know. The people who worked this land poured the oil for kings and nobles, then left and sat together. These workers, led by women, sat together, practiced, healed, took mugwa, fly agaric, lion's head, salvia. Theo is good at giving care. 
He knows now I need silence of words, richness of sound. She begins to sing to herself, no words, sea moving as she sings. I remember the seals in the sea, could my ancestor see their ancestor remembering? Healer sitting far from the church by water. I ask the rocks if they are my ancestors. They say yes, of course. Grey noontime sunset. Flames refracting off sea. The heart of Harriet's stomach has fire blossoming. Rippling inside a wide line in front of spines, throat, crown of head, lamb's tongue flame licking sky, forehead. Smiling, swaying still, Theo is gently singing, sea moving in time with her singing. Theo is silent, but the waves, oh, but the waves. Mm. That song is from me. And now we're going over to the very self same Lydia. Hi, everybody. Oh my God, wasn't that lovely? Oh, that was just so beautiful. Thank you so much, Simran. Um, I had the pleasure of working with all of these wonderful people and it's been such a pleasure unpacking and unraveling um, these threads and the conversations that emerged between us within our pairs and within all of us as a group. It's just been so fascinating. I've learned so much from, from everybody. Um, and like, like Simran, I suppose my piece um, explores the multiplicity of, of origin in Tintagel Castle and um, looking at the way that history is written by the victor, right? And this linear structure, structure to history and how so much has been cut out and uh, displaced by by those same victors and i wanted to recreate that that action by sort of demonstrating the amount of history that, and, and details that you can find and unlock if you look really hard but that a lot of them are cut off or away and the best way i felt that i could um recreate that was using the strike through so to create a lot of text that had the exposed literature of history and then the bit that was the bits that were cut out like physically cut out they're still there those remnants are still there but you just you have to look through you have to look harder to get to them um so i'm gonna share my screen i haven't actually thought of a a real title for for this piece um I think I, I think initially I just called it Tintagel in excerpts, um, but I don't know. It's it's still that's still sort of something that's coming to me. Um, so without further ado, I can move that and then do this and then zoom there. Dozen or so, one metre thick, three foot. Him an olive picker, living from the ground up, salting his tongue with the sun sliding down that Tunisian back. A golden slide, the bricks slicked with rich oil entrenched in thick masonry walls. They were feasting here, the kingdom of Dumnonia, fifth and sixth centuries Anno Dominum. Towel the origami Tunisian with his fifth and his tattooed children yummied the sky, they cloy dates, them babies hushing livestock as whoever living inside the Cornish complex lived, wealthy, royalty even, 
Uh, could be King Arthur slurping on the rind of black olives, their vines meeting the soil. Immerse yourselves in the myth that is facetian red slip, Lydian smiles pearling with gold kisses. How they wrestled one war after another, hounding future Anglo-Saxons with the cumined fingertips of waist-high Amazir, tongue in the Mediterranean, bluer than his blood, history's undulating tail whipping medieval fortifications. The sinewy heart of English architecture laden with tin, strapped Cornish backs, resting hands on camel skin sacks, the cold night sand peppering the Celtic spit, all the complete shiploads glittering, glittering amphorae, they flock the coastline winking, temper red wine to the entourage's lips, them suckling Droplets from the bark rest easy, the caramel wine sifted from petroglyphs. Mm. Bent arms like licorice sticks, the ancient legend rests easy on the mouth, and the Tunisian lies at the bottom of the bottle like backwash. Like softened grape pips, the cement reveals its recipe of trade. Oceans of Turkish pulled inside out, herb the oars and seasoning sailors. A teeth with sugared Maghreb, the Bible, it pulls her in and in. The pages piling like stones wrenched from beaches, blowing holes and O's in the walls. Rock stained glass, smitten hashish lines the banks, crumbling in fantasy hands. The root bleeds, abjad script. The heritage dotted like snake bite. The exchange glides its fangs out and the Roman signposts jolt the rocky peninsula, Centurion was here. How all the centuries effervesce with origins multiplicity, the very place from brick to mud to grassland, all mongreled with meaning, yet somehow reduced to an English heritage site, trademarked, uncovered, and archeologically perplexed. Whose home were you? No one has ever seen the face of you. But those merchants with acrid bones rattling far beneath have pierced your wrinkles once or twice, pinned you to a fairy tale. Dozen or so, collared sails, luffing Atlantic mood. They say rain fell upon its unveiling, the olive oil flaking like dried scalp, shuddering in green glass vials yearning. A curious call to timeless eternality. I want you to place your hand upon the castle's material, take its long, its metamorph metamorphic shard and ask it if it is really here. The perspectival nature of truth, how him have hands like feet and eyes like ribbons, no origin, beginning and end, like the way land is all and everything, mm -hmm. that baseless song. So that's me. Um, thank you to everybody for listening. I'm going to um, I'm going to pass this on now to um, our final our final writer for tonight, who is Emily Pritchard, and their piece. I think really it is, again, it's on Tintagel and Arthurian legend, but it really um, encompasses all the thematics of everything that everybody has explored, memory, history, landscape, legend, things that are forgotten and things that still feel tangible and real, and um, also takes us full circle back to Helen's piece as well. So I'm going to hand you over now. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia, for that really lovely introduction. That was so nice of you. Um, I loved the line of your poem, the ancient legend rests easy on the mouth. And I think what we were trying to do with this whole project was find the, the history and the legends and the stories that don't rest easy on the mouth, but that are that all the more important for it. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone for sharing their work. Uh, thanks to English Heritage's Shout Out Loud program, especially Fiona and Caroline for making this whole thing happen and bringing us together. It's been such a joy to work with this group of poets. Um, 
and I hope we continue to work together. Um, so I'm going to be sticking with Tintagel Castle, but returning to uh, King Arthur, which Helen started us off with. And my poem is about uh, a particular stone that was found as part of a drain cover at Tintagel um, in 1998. Uh, 1998. And um, many people have taken the stone as kind of proof that King Arthur lived at Tintagel Castle. Uh, but there, there may be more to the story than that. Um, so I'll just start screen sharing now. Artogne. We write our small names everywhere. Each piece of paper that I used in school marked yours at the ends of letters auto-filled in online forms, inside book jackets, under every childhood drawing, and left on the flat slate slabs of Welsh beaches. Like you, Artognu, your name not carved, but scratched into the surface, just enough to last these 1500 years scrawled underside a drain cover at Tintagel. Artognu, descendant of Paternus Collus, made this. Then again, Collus made this. Your name, Artognu, something like known as a bear or known as the bear. But you're not known at all, Artognu. Your first three letters seized upon and twisted your stone becoming Arthur's stone, broken on all sides, its meaning cracked. Your name become a sign, something to hang our hopes upon, to make the leap from myth to fact and back again. Reading your name this way is laying claim, saying here is where it happened and I do the same use my name's root to root myself, tell how Pritchard means at Richard, son of Richard, how my grandfather spoke only Welsh till he was eight years old and I speak none at all, hold on to my name like it's a tool and with it I can scratch myself into those rocky cliffs, ask hand on stone to be remembered to be a part of this. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. You've been a delightful audience. I think we can sense that from the, the chat and the general vibes. Um, and I'm now gonna hand over to Malaika, who's been amazing in running the workshops that have led to these poems. Um, so we're all very grateful to her and she's gonna now uh, lead a, a little session with you guys. Hi, I'm actually, because my camera's playing up, I'm actually going to um, come out of the chat and come back in so I can see all your questions and stuff and, 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 and kind of leave that because um, at the moment I can only see the screen. So maybe Caroline, if you can lead with the, with the poll and then I'll come back and, and leave my bit. Is that okay? Hi everybody, thanks so much and thank you all um, you amazing poets for sharing your work, it's absolutely incredible. So just whilst we wait for Malaika to come back, we've got a quick poll um, for you to take part in just about your experience tonight. We'd be really grateful if you would just click, click the boxes. Um, Malaika, just so you know, you're still here. I know, okay. I'm trying on another device. Okay, great. Right, sharing the poll now.
Sim. I think if you've finished um, completing the poll, thanks so much for everyone who has. I know that lots of you have. Um, maybe start thinking about if you've got any questions that you want to ask the group, any thoughts, um, anything that it's uh, kind of brought up for you and your experience potentially of uh, being at any of these sites or any questions that you've got about the specific specifics of the poems. Oh, great. What's happening? Okay. I'm back. Are you back in? I saw it for a bit. Great. Right. Um, have you got Have you got the question? Yes, I can see the chat now. If people want to put back in their questions that they, that um, they had, that'd be great. And um, because I can't, I can only see from where I've just got in. Um, and then I just want to sum up. Is that okay? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so I just want to sum up by saying as you as the audience, um, the, um, if you want to open your uh, the chat and put everyone and then if you type in then everyone can see it and I can and, and what I want to do is kind of think unravel the threads and take you back so that your mind can be back with everybody else. So we started off with Helen. Um, you know, as soon as she said in the workshop, as soon as they said in the workshop, Merlin, how is it hanging? Um, we knew that that poem was going to be a killer. Um, we're not. We're, we're just using the chat. So if you just open, if you just, if you just put in the chat, um, put your thing on all the attendees or, or everyone, and then I can kind of hear what I can see what people are saying. Um, and 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 um, and so we had that kind of Frank Lauren voice of that narrator of Guinevere just that will haunt us forever such a brilliant narration of that and we moved to Prana where the bobbin boys with the raw wood and the little fingers and the lungs kissing lake walk water and we we moved to Tejon with um um with the wood blocked raw I'm a raw blocked wood we lose ourselves in the voice and the voice was so frank and so um, elusive and all those voices. And then Phoebe took, took the thread up, you know, in the chapel smelling like dying oak, the people pounding off beats into the woods with a mother's side eye. And then Farhad took us to the chapel with floating prayers and there was music and the flesh grinding wood into pulp. Um, oh my God, the lines were so amazing. And Amani, um, who, you know, even though the, the, the work wasn't coming up on the screen, just smashed it with her, with the voice, um, you know, the, the energy, the gray, the small as a good, um, as a good motive that I promise to raise you, raise you the proudest house. Oh, I pine for you. I pine for you. That line, I held my heart when I heard that line, Gregory. Um, and like the dead, I wake to find myself. When Gregory read that first line, we all fell out of our chairs in our house um, with envy. A chapel that is half that is half door and half clock. Um, and the last line that he landed that poem on. And then Simran, um, new queer witches picking plants for the hedgehogs rose as we as we walked. Um, and how, when every time Mogworth came up, we were like, oh my goodness. And now I need silence of words, richness of sounds. And Lydia, the form on the page just took it away. And can we just go back to talking about Gregory's form on the page and breakdown of form? But Lydia had so much gems as well. Anglo-Saxon with cumin fingertips, the Bible page rising like stones. Um, um, were led from beaches, and then we ended with Emily um, on the and that when when the in the poem when the poem says this this known as a bear, but then that bit you stone your stone broken on all sides its meanings cracked. Um, 
and that's I think what everybody did they broke the stone they broke the stone in these buildings in these heritage sites and they cracked the meanings open um, we're just going to have 10 minutes where people can just type in the the, the, the chat for the, the participants, any observations, any inspirations? I know you've been doing that all evening. Any questions you had, any things that are resonating in your head, just as a way to end, you know, because sometimes you've read and you've been so involved in the reading as the artist and you've spent so much time writing and cracking it open that at the end, you kind of need that, 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 that interaction to, you know, to just say what, how people feel to just see how the poems were received. And so um, this is us unraveling your threads. This is you putting bits of your threads, spools and bobbins into the into the thread um, for anybody. Um, and um, um, Kathy asks, has this made the, any of you rethink about their experience when visiting ancient, ancient sites? Um, if anybody wants to answer that. Um, uh, yes, uh, I think I've always approached, um, historical sites with, um, curiosity and, and sort of, uh, sort of always second guessing it. I think maybe perhaps one of the, um, the biggest things is how, how do we impart what we understand or what we know, or what we've uncovered in our own work to, to other people. The next time anybody in the public visits Goodshaw Chapel or Tintagel Castle, you know, how do they get to understand the exploitation of these places or, you know, the exchanges that have happened in across the world throughout history that intersects those places? Like, how do how do we increase our cognizance? Because I think part of the duty of this program is to do just that. Um, to to increase cognizance and and knowledge and awareness of of places um so yeah and um someone was just curious to hear about some of the poet's creative processes um because they were so special to hear the the final outcome um and they're stunned by how you got to the final outcome i know some of you shared a bit of the process but if you want to talk about it it was quite a quick process um we, we didn't have long to do this um so yes if anybody wants to answer that i mean i already talked a little bit about my process but in terms of like the physical writing because uh, because of the time crunch element um it was good to have a form to sort of force me to um, actually get it written for today. Um, so that was the 10, syllab uh, the ten syllables um, and then um, having 18 lines in each section trying to recombine them. But what was difficult was doing that's very hard. And so I was feeling the clock ticking. And because when Edward Young wrote his poem, he did it pretty much either while riding on horseback or while he couldn't sleep at one o'clock in the morning. And it got to like 12.30 the night before one of our workshops. And I was like, if I stay up a half an hour, I'll just do like a free write. And then I'll try and use a bit of that. Um, and then it got to like three in the morning. I hadn't really got much written, but I had little phrases and stuff. And lots yeah. of that is where phrases came from was being sleep deprived. Um, <laughs> so not a particularly healthy creative process, I guess, but yeah. that was part of it for me. And Rebecca says, I'm interested to know where you started when researching these lesser known stories. I imagine source material was hard to find for these untold stories. Maybe this felt restrictive, maybe freeing. Would be great to hear anybody's experience of that. Um, just on uh, sort of Goodshaw Chapel, um, that was extremely hard to find source material for. Um, and I think with, with a lot of the sites, obviously the, the frustration in the, in the pandemic is that we can't go to these places uh, talk to people, etc. Um, so we had to find creative ways around that, uh, and, and finding source material online or, or, or however we did. Um, yeah, I had a really uh, interesting conversation with the guy who was the key keeper at Goodshaw Chapel, and that's how I got a lot of uh, my information. I, I rang him up one day and had a chat with him about the chapel in his lifetime uh, and and how it changed in, in the local area, and and that was where I got a lot of the inspiration for 
for, for un unraveling the brickwork and, and the story of that place. Anybody else want to respond to that or the question before in terms of process? Um, I actually want to shout out Helen and Perena. Well, everybody's work was incredible, but about the creative process, I found that when people, when all of us were going away and unpacking history and unpacking these narratives which had gone unheard of, um, I felt that people who had chosen to do something with form or meter ended up revolutionizing those forms. Perena's piece revolutionizes the, ha the haven and Malika you mentioned that in one of the workshops and it's and Helen, Helen's piece revolutionizes the perceptions that we have about the epic poem um, mm. and contemporary language and and the idea of being able to modernize and uh, reclaim that form as a woman because epic poetry is notoriously mm -hmm. belong to men right so mm -hmm. reclaiming that form as a female and talking about it in a whole different way and it, with a different outlook is just so it's so pertinent really and it intersects exactly what we're doing with history we're mm -hmm. refreshing it um mm. yeah and um and um Anybody else wants to answer that and then we'll go to Steve's question. Thanks, Lydia. That's so nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to add, because I really resonated with what Gregory was saying about, like, I also stayed up late one night because I was like, oh, God, I need to write some more of this. Um, and actually, it was really productive. So I don't know. That's really funny that you also have that experience. <laughs> um, I had a, I, as I mentioned in my introduction, um, I'm in the Roundhouse Poetry Collective and we're doing our sessions on Zoom at the moment. So I had one of those sessions in between our group workshops um, where the workshop leader, Cecilia Knapp, was just going, literally going to a random word generator website and that was the prompt for our like free write. Um, that's why I have some random words <laughs> in my poem, mm -hmm. uh, like reticello and moilsome. Oh, I've... I've unveiled the secret guys it's all random <laughs> but like i think a lot of um yeah i think a lot of writing often is make putting the random things together or like unexpected things together maybe um mm. and making it mm. you know say what you want it to say or it's saying things that you didn't expect you were going to say as actually turned out with me and i think um following on for that we gave ourselves a lot of permission saying you know follow the threads um, take take imaginative leaps. We're not historians. This is a stimulus for us to create imaginative and, and creative work, for us to see the gaps, for us to reimagine, for us to, to merge time periods, for us to do anything, for us to be speculative. So we really gave every everyone was given gave themselves permission to do that. Steve says, how is your interpretation different from the labels and guides we usually get in these places? Can help in on that one. I was looking at that and I was thinking about it. I was thinking, is it that we don't touch on facts, but I think all of us do because everyone's poems were researched. Is it that, you know, it's about sort of the setting or the materials used, but all of us touch on that kind of thing too. I think the main difference from maybe perhaps the placard that you'd see on a site is the magic of what, where writing can take you in time. I think when you're looking at the image, well, sort of like the placard on the site, you're looking at what once was. And when you're doing this within sort of a poetic form, you're transported back into the past, or maybe in Lydia, you're exploring the comparison between past and present. You're, you're magicking into a time where the site was alive. And mm. I really love Lydia's line where she's talking about how, you know, these magical places, you know, have been transmogrified into just English heritage sites, which is, you know, no shade on English heritage, but it's true. These were places where stories were happening, where people were living. Mm. Mm -hmm. And a placard mm. doesn't give you all of that. It just, mm. you can walk around and you can manage it, imagine it, but it's hollow. I think the main difference mm. is that the poems bring them back to life. Mm. I think, how did your body in? Um, because you were put in, you were, you know, you because of time factors and because you, we didn't have, t you, you don't have anybody to feed off and bounce off. We, we decided on body systems, you know, where you worked with someone from the other group. You didn't work with someone you knew necessarily. How did that work? Was it awkward at first? Was it 
how did you did you decide that you have to make decisions about how you're going to work social media phone what was going to happen um anybody want to say about that because i think that that something happened in there was some magic in that and i've been dying to ask that um but we didn't have time in the workshops because we had so much to do well i could i could speak to that one a bit um i think i was super lucky to have lydia who used to live in cornwall and so had all this like like real lived experience of the area and was like, oh, there's this museum of witchcraft there. And there's this, I, and I don't want to tell your story for you, but there's this like this creek, which you can't walk into because if you walk into it with bare feet, you'll be cursed. And like, it gave me this, like, I think it gave me like a way in to really feel what <laughs> it's like to be there. Like not just, I've never been to Cornwall to like, to like, what's it like to be a person in those places? Like the way Lydia mm. talked about it was just like, <clears throat> somewhere you somewhere you go somewhere real um and i think for me that loops back to the last question which is what's the difference between a poet and a placard um for me it's a lot about embodiment um and like as a poet i think a lot of poets and a lot of the poets in this group like really like we're speaking from the body um the other thing that i do alongside poetry is being a yoga teacher which is all about using my words to get people in their body right and i think often poetry can be very similar to yoga teaching you like experience something wonderful in your body and then you find a way to use your words to bring someone else into that same experience in their body or into some equivalent experience of their body um like maybe through imagining this place or through kind of dreaming their way into some um, mm. yeah i just think so i think also interestingly about like um, having a buddy in this also, as Simran just said, about like feeding into this idea of like the poet, like not versus the placard, because we're not in an adversarial relationship necessarily, but like actual life experience in the here and now is like the layering of different perspectives. Like even in this Zoom chat, people, our realities are like literally different by the way, like, all of our life experience up until this point informs our ideological ideas, our emotions, the way we physically hold ourselves. And so the way we interact with each other and physical space is deeply changed by that. Um, and so I think what a poem allows, which might maybe a placard doesn't, um, is that it la allows that layering back in maybe, that it adds layered perspectives especially in an evening like this where we're hearing loads of different poems from different people about the same space and you yeah. i think like some hearing some of the different poems about the same space would make you think you wouldn't necessarily without being told know that it was the same physical space but we've drawn the different things um and that buddying mm -hmm. process worked like that as well you hear in that conversation you have um uh you change your own perspective and you hear their perspective about what your space is and hearing about their space if it's different or the same and how that physically changes your relationship to reality but also just the individual poem as well. I think um, just to add to that something I found really interesting about even knowing that these poems they weren't just to be written for an anthology but to be shared in this space was um was how to um how to gender voices and how to how to throw your voice in order to uh, to navigate all those different like um narratives that we're trying to cover because we've done so much research and it's just like how how are we gonna um get the that tail across with our voices and our actual um li li little capacity um I think that's something that um Phoebe who's not here today we were talking about that on the phone earlier today just um how they they were finding it interesting to to view each stanza as a different um, moment to um, push themselves for the performance. So, um, yeah, it's something that I'm I'm very struck by after this experience actually. Um, just to jump in on the port and placard thing, I think something this process really brought like highlighted for me is that so the bobbin mill that I wrote about is now a museum and you can go and walk around in it and stuff. And it just started making me question the complacency with which we memorialize things, like what's memorialized, like how many voices 
like so it, it made me think of my high bun as a as a tool to dig with um yeah it just made me question that a lot mm -hmm. say more about that as high bun as a tool to dig with that sounds fascinating so initially I struggled a lot because I was free writing and it was just going in free verse and it was a bit all over the place. So I decided to choose a form and I chose the high bun because it's, it's supposed to be such a like neat little unit with a prose block and a haiku at the end. Um, and I just wanted to explode it in the middle to sort of showcase or like foreground the erased voices of those children. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Yeah, because in yours, it was when I spoke to the historian and tried to get information for you guys for the initial thing, the historian had said the only boys work there. But in your dig and you found this girl, Emily, didn't you? You found there was one. Just one girl, just one girl who officially worked the machines and was registered as an employer. So. Um, this is the last chance to get anything and I'll be closing in a minute. Um, Lee says, I wonder how you get into the mindset of that space, perhaps without visiting for some owning to the current um, situation. Um, did anybody find that? I, I know that even I'm doing my piece and it's really hard because I usually visit the space and usually walk around with it and imagine myself in it. Um, so can anybody tell Lee uh, um, any insights or any tips they would give about getting to a space when you're trying to write from it far away during the um during this COVID? Um something that me and Phoebe found really helpful was a was a workshop done by uh, Diane Nguyen uh, who did one on sort of writing into images because that's kind of what we had for, for this project was with the images of the places um, and that was a really helpful workshop. I think it's still available on, on Instagram um, if, if anyone wants to have a look at it. But yeah, writing into images um, and trying to uh, like access your creativity to, to transport yourself there was, uh, is, it was, was really key for this project. Um, for myself, I, um, I wanted to habit the sounds of the space so something that I um, looked up was was how the machine sounded and I tried to build this syllabic count of my poem around those and also just like the sound of the nearby nature and, and how those things could inform like the atmosphere of the poem um, yeah I think I think sound is something that um, I'm, I'm glad that I can't could so is googleable I also watched a YouTube video that someone had made of their trip to Tintagel Castle, which didn't have any like commentary or anything. It was just shots of the castle with like a nice soundscape of the sea because it's right by the sea, which is never the kind of thing I would have thought I'd be watching on YouTube, but was actually really useful and quite a, a nice respite from the current situation. Definitely. I hear that, Emily. And it was it was not not that I went and found a really beautiful YouTube video like that. But you know how you can just drag and drop a person on Google Maps? I did that and sort of walked around the grounds of Goodshaw Chapel. But I think the other nice thing, like uh, something else that I took from it is that sometimes when you go in person, you miss out on all the tiny details. And when you get bogged down and you're like, what, five pages deep in Google Images, you start finding all of the weird tidbits that people put up like um, outside Goodshaw Chapel, there's a, a graveyard and some of the inscriptions from the tombstones were on there, uh, final poems from previous pastors in the church and that kind of thing that you just actually might not get the chance to see if you went yourself. So I think there's there's value and I think both ways of, of, of exploring a space. I think as well, um, the most valuable thing of not being there in person is because we've all been unified by a central purpose of unpacking history. It kind of goes back to what Simran was saying. The conversations that I had with Simran and with everybody about history and about the displacement of, of memory, um, talking, about, talking about things, it almost became metaphysical in nature right like mm. the conversations that I had with Simran when we were talking about psychotropics and the way that um, we are off the land 
and the land is of us and it's a symbiotic relationship those conversations almost had a metaphysical manifestation in me it's like i was there in those descriptions in those exchanges um and 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 also i think if it comes from a personal place like mm. for example with me when i was looking at Tintagel Castle, I was looking at the multiplicity of origin. Literally, Tintagel Castle is defined by its relationship with other parts of the world. The exchanges that were made with other people who picked olive olives from trees in Tunisia and Algeria and Lebanon. It's defined by a, a personal close tie with me being, you know, half Algerian and having this whole ancestry um, that, that I didn't even know existed. And to find out that that doesn't actually necessarily make up a part of the discourse when you look at a placard um, uh, at Tintagel um, that is almost uh, that kind of takes you there it takes you into that space and it pushes you further into that realm even if you're not there physically in person you're able to somehow excavate and hold the disappearance and the pain just through um, that that personal intersection that you have with a place in terms of history just through the conversations that we were having and plus everyone's so talented and mm. um articulate that you're just vibing off one another because you're all artists you're all just mm. giving each other ideas yeah. and sharing information and then we were led mm. by malika as well who is just bomb like amazing <laughs> everything so it's yeah we didn't need to go there to be to to be influenced i think like it was amazing Oh, um, I think I think I'm gonna have to um, to end it there. It was it it's it was such a pleasure to work with everybody, and I really I'm glad that we that we started off with this thing of following the threads, and we followed the everyone followed the threads with each other in building relationships, in researching together, in discussing together, and in also presenting the the, the performance and the and the readings to this. Look at the threads we followed, giving you an insight into that, and your questions show that how fascinated you were. Um, just like me. Um, and I want to end with with that whole notion and sum up that it, it, it seems to be embodiment, kind of trying to embody the work, excavating, trusting, and just taking imaginative leaps that we're here. Um, this is the first, I, I worked with two different groups. So I worked with the writing squad and um, Barbican Young Poets, who you saw tonight. But on the 6th of, um, on the 6th of November, um, I've been working with Beat Freaks and Artful Scribe as well. And they've also been doing their research and are, are in the last week. So if anybody wants to experience more responses to the sites and, 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 and also, you know, what the young, the young, you know, future kind of prize winning writers, if you want to see them, you know, before they all get out there and start, you know, um, killing the literary landscape to see that you can see you've seen them before I would urge you to come to that performance as well because I think I've had the opportunity to work with some of the most brilliant young writers um, in both groups who are in this landscape and I'm sure that hearing their work tonight you can understand just how amazing it's been and rewarding it's been for me to, to see their work and experience it and I'm so chuffed that you were able to come thank you for coming thank you to Caroline and English Heritage for providing us with a space to get a stimulus to, to get some new poems that are hot to trot. Um, yes, good night. Um, and thank you for interacting with the audience and staying. I think I've gone three minutes over. Caroline, I think um, I'll hand over to you in case there's anything you want to say, but I'll say good night to everyone. And if everyone gives a virtual clap and stamping feet and you know, hitting glasses with spoons and everything um, for everyone who read tonight. Wasn't the work fantastic? Great, thank you so, so much, Malaika, and to all of the poets for this evening. It was so enjoyable. Um, we hope to see some of you next week on Friday the 6th. And uh, that's, that's everything. Thanks, everybody. Bye.